for the spring lecture series, uh, Joseph Barsano, who uh, is a, a postdoctoral scholar in the Fermi Institute working on string theory, as we'll see during the course of the lectures. Uh, he got his graduate degree from Harvard, uh, and uh, with the uh, and Wally, yes. Uh, then he spent a, a, a postdoctoral So anyway, he is, is, he is uh, uh, very much an expert in how to uh, connect some of the intricate geometry of string theory with the particle physics models that we know are so successful in explaining the results of uh, uh, energy physics. And so uh, it looks like the next going to be something that we have. Different from all the other fundamental forces that we see in nature. 
right there, we just treat it like the other models. You know, the other forces that we see, the nuclear forces, electromagnetism, why is it so difficult to quantize gravity? And then once we have an idea of why that problem is so difficult, we'll talk about how string theory manages to provide a solution to that. And hopefully talk a little bit about the kinds of questions that we should be asking string theory to solve for us. You know, there are some things that string theory is good for, some things that it's not. If we understand why quantum gravity is hard, then we can understand the things that we expect to learn from the proper description of quantum gravity. And then finally, I want to bring everything all together <coughs> and describe how string theorists think about particle physics and how we should have how we think about connecting the very short distance of description of physics that string theory gives us to the longer distance observations that we're seeing at the LHC and other slopes. So that's the basic plan. And I, I, I give this little advertising because I hope you join us for all that. It should be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. So. <laughs> all right. So uh, any string theorist or you know, any person who's going to talk about unification is important to solve. You have to start with the original unifying theory. So that's what I'm going to start with. And that's, you know, the fact that in the early 1800s, people knew there was this thing electricity, they knew there was this thing magnetism, and there's a nice beautiful story to how people came to this sort of unified description of both. So, well, we know this is electric force that acts between charged objects. If I have two objects of opposite or same charge, they repel each other. If I have two objects of opposite charge, they attract each other. And this is something you can you can give a little apparatus to an undergraduate and put them in a lab and they can easily see it. You take a you can take a glass rod and rub it with some fur and then bring it close to a little ball of paper. And you can watch the ball of paper get attracted to the rod, and that's showing you that there's some force that the rod is exerting on the paper, and that force is due to the uh, electric force. But you know, in the 1800s, it's a question of how do you measure this force precisely? And Coulomb invented this really interesting instrument, um, which is uh, called the torsion balance to do this. Coulomb was thinking a lot about, um, in the time before, he was studying a lot of uh, the physics of wires and the thin strings. And the fact that if you, you know, if you twist the string, then it, you know, it doesn't want to be twisted. The more you twist the string, the more you twist the string, it's like compressing a spring. The more you twist the string, the, you know, the, the more it resists you. And he thought that the fact that you could you know, relate how much you twist the string to the restoring force that it exerts could be used in order to make precision measurements of forces. So he designed this force imbalance with that idea. So you have a, a, some kind of ball, which is mounted to a plate or something. You put some charge on it. And you, you hang the second ball uh, by a thread. And if you put charge here and charge here, the things will repel each other. And it'll repel to a point where the force um, attraction or propulsion due to the electric force is, is uh, exactly canceled by the restoring force from the, from the string because it doesn't want to be twisted. So this allows you to make some very precise measurements of what the force is between these two things. And you can even determine how it varies as a function of distance. And this allowed Coulomb to deduce an inverse square law. His inverse square law was for forces, but I was invited for fields because we like to think of this as a wider field. And it basically says that this uh, charged particle um, generates an electric field, which generates a force. The electric field is determined by the charge. It has this 1 over r squared dependence where it decreases like the square of the distance between the charged particles. And then there's this constant in here, which is the permittivity of free space, which is just some number, which uh, depends on the space of units, but we like to use these units as and so on. But the point is that with this nice portion balance, Coulomb was able to make very sensitive measurements of exactly how strong an electric field that a charged particle generated. And that strength of the electric field generated by the charged particle is parameterized by some number, epsilon, which you can measure in the lab. So just as an aside, I bring up the torsion balance because the basic idea of torsion balances are still in use today. Um, well, Cavendish, shortly after Newton, used the torsion balance and a torsion balance set up similar uh, to study gravitational interactions. And there's a group at the University of Washington and others that, believe that are using similar ideas in order to measure um, the strength of the gravitational interaction at very short distances. If you read about, um, you know, if you read people talking about uh, fifth force measurements, they're using, you know, basic ideas that are similar to this. So Coulomb's really great invention about torsion balances is still finding use even in modern physics, which I think is really incredible. So that's the electric force. The other force people knew about was the magnetic force. And this is quite evident. You know, big bed of iron filings, you draw a magnet in it, the filings will be acted on by some force and move around in order to line up into a pattern like this. And what they're really doing is they're showing us the force lines of the magnetic, or the uh, field lines of the magnetic field. And people knew about another important magnetic field. They knew about the magnetic field of the Earth because, well, all of navigation depended on that <laughs> in your compass terms because uh, of the Earth's magnetic field. So people knew about this electric force, and they knew about this magnetic force, and in the 1800s they started seeing evidence that these two things were not different, and they were actually very closely related to each other. So there's two ways that they are, um, there's two ways that are described that people could see that they're related to each other. 
Um, one is the fact that if you take charged particles, the things which generate electric fields and put them in motion, that generates a magnetic field. And there's a simple experiment you can do that Verstead did, and that is to take a, take a sort of a, a ring and put some wires around the ring and pass a current through the ring. And then you put a compass in the middle of the ring, and if, when you hook the battery up and send the current around the ring, the compass is left. So before the current is on, the compass is pointing towards magnetic north because it only sees the north pole. But after you run the current through the ring, the compass turns because the magnetic field is generated that acts with the compass. So an electric current generates a magnetic field. <coughs> the, you can actually quantify this to see how strong of a magnetic field is generated by a current. And you can use a similar apparatus to, you know, like a torsion balance, for example. I actually don't really know so much about how this one works. This is an ampere cable. But you can do a measurement which tells you, you know, if you have a fixed current, how strong of a magnetic field is generated. And again, there's a number that comes out of that measurement. It's this thing which we call the permeability of free space. There's this name U naught. I don't know why it's, you know, this engineers know much better than I do why this name permeability is, uh, is, 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 uh, is relevant. So, the second, second point is that a change in magnetic field can induce an electric field. If I take a coil of wire, I take a magnet, I move the magnet back and forth from the coil, I'll generate a current. So if I move this back and forth, and this, this uh, ammeter will, will, will show a current. And this is how electric like, generators, motors, and things like that work. So, you know, moving charges, moving, moving charges, moving electric fields generate magnetic fields, moving magnets generate electric fields. So they cannot be different phenomena, they have to be one and the same. And in 1867, Maxwell wrote down his theory, which provided a unified description of all these things. So it's four very simple, beautiful equations, which I thought I have to write. They're on t-shirts, so I have to write them. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, sure, I'm sure the store, the next store probably sells these t-shirts. Um, used to see them around all the time. So um, there's four very simple equations, and these describe all electromagnetism, everything that you see. It's quite remarkable. And in, you know, basically, there's one that says that the charge is generating electric fields. There's no notion of magnetic charge. And then the two most important, a changing magnetic field generates electric field, and a changing electric field generates magnetic field. And the point I want to make about all these is that these laws of electromagnetism, which describe everything we know about electricity and magnetism with one framework, depend on two numbers. And these are two numbers that you can measure in the lab with some very old school apparatus, apparatus that have been around since the 1800s, um, the torsion balance and this thing, the ampere table. So everything can be used. You can do two measurements. And once you do two measurements, you can start cranking out predictions. This is what we want about our physical theory. This is what people are asking string theory to do all the time, actually. <laughs> so the remarkable thing is that Maxwell's theory came with a prediction. And the prediction was the existence of electromagnetic waves. So the idea being that if you change the electric field, the change in the electric field wants to generate a magnetic field. But the change in the magnetic field wants to generate an electric field. And because of the relative size between these two, it actually generates electric field in the opposite direction. So the growing electric field induces the magnetic field, the growing magnetic field pulls the electric field back down, which pulls the magnetic field back down, and then you know, the process just repeats itself over and over again. And the beautiful part about these equations is they tell us that not only does the electric field and magnetic field go up and down to a single point, but that the wave propagates. And it propagates with a speed that's determined by these two numbers that we measured in the lab, this mu naught and epsilon naught. So in particular, Maxwell predicted electromagnetic waves and he predicted that they propagate with a speed that you could measure in the lab. You send your undergraduate into the lab, they take a torsion balance of your experiment, and your table do the experiment, you take two numbers, multiply one over the square root, and you predicted the speed of electromagnetic waves. And people had done these experiments back in the day, and they knew what this number was, and they actually also had measured the speed of light with some reasonable accuracy back then. And they saw that these numbers really closely agreed, and we know that now we know that they had to agree because light is just an electromagnetic wave. So, in other words, Maxwell's theory predicts the speed of light. And it predicts the speed of light in terms of two numbers that we can just go and measure in light. That's the takeaway point from the first but, 10 minutes of the book. So, um, and it's a pretty big number. And this one fact, the fact that uh, you can do two experiments, and with those two experiments you can predict the speed of light, revolutionized all of classical physics. It took about 30 years for this process to actually happen because people were very confused for a while. There was this notion of ether you probably read about that really confused the literature. If you read about some of the original stuff that Lorenz said, it just makes no sense. I'm going to try to put ether. So why did that, uh, why did that turn classical physics on its head? Well, well, 
The example I want to, I want to use to show why it's so crazy, why many of you already know, um, is to think about driving along I-55. So, you think about me standing in front of a cat to Google Maps for, uh, obviously this is produced by Google, thank you for your money. So, obviously this is me standing on the side of the road, um, my car broke down or something, so I'm standing there. And you're driving at a normal speed of 70 miles an hour. Um, I'm not advocating you to drive 70 on my 55. Um, I'm just making an observation that if you don't, then you get brought off the road like I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, this is being recorded, so I have to be careful. Do not drive 70. <laughs> so, the normal driver going 70 miles an hour. And let's suppose some crazy guy was moving by 120. So if I measure the speed that the crazy guy is going, I think the crazy guy is going 120 miles an hour. But if you measure the speed the crazy guy is going, well, you think he's going slower. If he was going 70, then you'd think he wasn't moving at all, because you'd be going next to each other. And since he's going 120, you say, oh, well, he's going 120, but I'm going 70, so I must see him going 50, which is the difference. Okay. And that makes total sense. But now we imagine we replace a, you know, you and I aren't looking at the, at the crazy driver, we're looking at a light ray. Now, there's light rays everywhere, but you can imagine it's a big flat ball goes off back here, and we have some magical apparatus that allows us to measure the speed of the light ray. And, okay, light ray, I've converted the speed of light to the miles per hour, just, just as units we like to use for speeds on the freeway. Um, so, if the light ray is emanated back here and it goes shooting by, I see the light ray going at the speed of light, which is 671 miles an hour. And our reasoning for the previous slide would suggest that you see the light going a little bit slower, the 671 million minus 70 miles an hour. And you might say there's no way you're ever going to have an instrument that's going to measure this difference to any precision, because you know, this looks basically like 671 million anyway. But we're living in thought experiment land, so I can imagine the crazy driver's not really going 120, but it's going 120 million. Never mind the fact that the crazy driver's going to instantly be in the lake. Um, <laughs> okay. Forget about that. Uh, the crazy driver sees the light ray, but how fast would this crazy driver, if he measured the speed of the light ray just before he kept going into the lake, how fast is this crazy driver see the light ray? He's going to see it at 671 million minus 120 million. So, okay, we all see three vastly different speeds of the light ray. And that's a problem, because each one of us remembered to bring our torsion balance in our hamster table. I don't know if you mine, and in fact, I, uh, my wife was uh, on, the, on the drive in, she was measuring, you know, I'm not so on about with her, with our torsion balance and her table the way. Um, we each do an experiment. I do an experiment on the side of the road, you do an experiment in your car, the crazy person does an experiment in his car, every one of us measures, you know, an epsilon much. And if we think there's any sense of physics at all, the result, you know, the result of my experiment should be the same as the result of your experiment, and the same as the result of this guy's experiment. We should all measure mu naught and epsilon naught to be the same. And Maxwell's theory tells us that once we measure mu naught and epsilon naught, the speed at which electromagnetic waves propagate is just a fundamental property. If we see an electromagnetic disturbance, it's going to move at this speed. It's not going to move at this speed, and it's not going to move at this speed. It's going to move at this fixed speed. Maxwell's theory tells us this speed is not a relative thing, it is an absolute thing. So what's going on? Well, there's really two possibilities. Um, one possibility is that everybody really does see the light rate going 671 million miles an hour, and then we have to revisit, you know, how do we relate what I see to what you see. And the second possibility is that Maxwell's laws of electromagnetic magnetism are different for every observer. You know, I, which is basically saying that my measurement of epsilon naught, my force of balance, will be different than your measurement of epsilon naught, your force of balance. So these are the two possibilities we're faced with. And it's, Either one is very strange, right? You know, the reasoning of the previous slide was very clear. Everybody should not see the light going the same speed. But we do believe that the laws of physics should look the same for everybody. And uh, this is where Einstein came in. And I'm, mm -hmm. I said, I'll be answered to the second one, for the first one. The laws of physics should look the same for all observers. If I perform an experiment, and you perform an experiment in your car, we should get the same answer. Well, even though in practice we won't, because you'll break the portion down, it's not possible. <laughs> that um, so the laws of physics should look the same for all observers. Now, everybody must see the same speed of light, which means that the way that we related what different observers see is somehow flawed, and we have to fix it. Now, one question you can ask is, how do we know Einstein's right? Um, and why do people even believe Einstein when he came up with this? And I'm going to use this as an excuse to tell you about another classic experiment that maybe you've heard about and the ideas of which are still in use today. Um, and, okay, so how do we know? 
Well, let's suppose that light, everybody doesn't see the same speed of light. Light moves at 631 million miles per hour, so preferred reference frame, people call this the ether. I'm going to try not to say the word ether anymore because it's confusing. <laughs> and so, um, everybody, suppose light only moves at 631 miles per hour, so preferred reference frame. Well, we are always in motion, at least most of the time, we have to be in motion with respect to that reference frame because we're constantly moving around the sun. If we suppose that reference frame is a reference frame of the sun, then we're moving with respect to it now, and six months from now, we'll be moving with respect to it in the opposite direction. So, if light only make, moves at 631 miles per hour in the frame of the sun, where the sun is playing the role of me standing on the side of the road, then if we measure the speed of light in this direction, well, we're moving with the light, so we should measure that the light looks a little bit slower. And if we measure the speed of light in this direction, well, we should you know, measure 631 million miles an hour. So, you can take the question of, does everybody measure the same speed of light, and replace it with the question of, well, do we measure the speed of light to be the same in all directions? Not quite the same, but, but pretty close. And you can ask, well, how do we test this? And uh, um, Michelson invented a great instrument for this called the interferometer. And here's a picture of what an interferometer looks like. <coughs> and the idea is, you, you take a light source and you fire a beam of light at some mirror. And this mirror is semi-transparent, which means some of the light reflects up and some of the light goes through. So you essentially split the beam. And you let part of the beam travel up on, this, on one of the interferometer arms to a mirror and come back. And you let the other uh, light beam travel on the other interferometer arm and come back. And if, this, if the arms are the same length, and we designed the apparatus so the arms are the same length, and if light moves the same speed in both directions, then you know there shouldn't be any difference between light going up here and coming back, and light going up here and coming back. You know, we move the same distance, at the same speed, and the same amount of time. So when the light beams come back and they're redefined, um, they're moving up at the same time, and the electric field is increasing at the same time, and increasing at the same time. So the light waves are in phase. I tried to draw it here. So this is like the blue beam, and this is supposed to be the green beam, but somehow it's color. It's, it's a too dark of a green for this projector. Um, but you can imagine that if the light, if it's not light, if light moves slower, say in this direction, then the amount of time that light spends traveling along here is greater than the amount of time that it travels along here. And that means that when you know this light comes back, it's not quite at the same place in its motion. It's displaced a little bit. It's displaced a little bit like this. So the light waves don't add up, you know, empirically when they come back to here. So now there are techniques to, to actually observe this. When you send this recombined beam down here, you can see whether there's interference like this happening. Um, I didn't want to get into a discussion of all of the optics because I want to be able to get the optics experiment at the end. So I'm just going to. It's going to tell you that when you take these light beams and you look at them down here, you see a bunch of interference fringes, and when the alignment moves, these interference fringes move. So what Michelson and Morley basically can do is take their interferometer and start rotating it in circles. And if the speed of light differs in one arm or the other, then these lines, these fringe lines, should move. And they did this experiment. Obviously, they didn't see anything. They saw the speed of light was the same in each direction. Now, an interferometer like this has another use. Michelson and Morley were interested if the speed of light was slower in this direction than in this direction. But another way that light, light could be different coming back here is if the length of one arm is different from the length of the other. If the length of the green arm is, say, shorter than the length of the blue arm, then it will also take less time for the light to go here and come back, and you'll also get interference effects when you come back here. So if, say, for example, the gravitational wave comes into the system, what's that gravity wave going to do? It's going to make the gravity, effect of the gravity wave is to change the length of one arm relative to the length of the other. And so if a gravitational wave comes in, you should see these fringe lines moving. So people are using interferometer instruments today as a means of looking for gravitational waves. And I thought it would be kind of fun to show a picture of the original Michael Sorrelli interferometer, which is a very old picture. This is basically just an optical bench with the mirrors on it, and the interferometer arms are about five meters in size. And here are the interferometers people are using today. This is uh, the aerial photograph of the LIGO interferometer in Hanford, Washington. Um, you can imagine a precision instrument like this is, does, it does not get along well with the seismic activity in Washington. They had an earthquake a couple of years ago that set them back a little bit of time. That was a bit busy. But the interferometer arms here are four kilometers long each. And uh, hopefully we'll be hearing about gravitational waves. We'll hopefully be hearing about detection of gravity waves the next couple of years. I'm told that uh, after the next upgrade, they should be sensitive to binary spirals. When you have binary stars far away, sort of collapsing in on each other, that the very violent process will produce lots of gravity waves, and that's the kind of thing they hope to see soon. Okay. 
So back back to the back to the story is getting a little away from the side on the parameters. The parameters. Um, we had this this me standing on the side of the road as a normal driver going seven miles an hour with two possibilities, and everybody sees me do a light point at the same speed, or Maxwell's law of electromagnetism for different for every observer. Einstein told us that we should cross this out, and Michelson and Morley said this is okay. Everybody really will see the light ray going at the same speed. So coming back to it, everyone has to measure the speed of light to be the same. That means that we have to change the way that we relate with different observers see. The way that what you see is related to the way you know what I see is not denying just subtraction of velocities and things like that. So that's I'm this is sort of a uh, a transition point to the question of interesting like this. Probably all heard about this. Okay, so so now I want to talk a little bit more in detail about what changes we have to make to the way that we relate to the observer C. And I want to use a simpler example than having cars moving on with a freeway. I want to use some very simple example, which is this. I'm standing here with a clock. You're in a car and you're driving past me. Um, and at some time after you pass me, a light bulb goes off in the distance. So I'm going to measure the distance of the light bulb, and you're going to measure the distance of the light bulb um, when you see it go off. And naively, what we expect is the distance that you measure uh, to the light bulb when it goes off is the same as what I measure, less how far you go you know, in, in the time that, between when you pass me when it goes off. So you pass me at time zero, the light bulb goes off at time t, in that time you move this far, so you are this much closer to the light bulb than I am. And so that's the one naive thing. And the second naive thing is we should both agree that the light bulb goes off at the same time. We expect that if I think the light bulb goes off at 3 o'clock, and you think the light bulb goes off at 3 o'clock, that, 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 that's, that's how it would work. And I mean, the unfortunate thing is that these transformation laws are not consistent with electromagnetism. And the fact that we ran into this problem with everybody measuring different speeds of light is just one manifestation of that, the fact that the electromagnetic laws don't preserve this transformation. The correct transformation was actually deduced by Lorentz before Einstein came up with his theory of relativity. Lorentz just didn't know sort of the physical interpretation. He was confused by this ether phenomenon. Um, and the correct transformations are these. You'll notice that when v is the velocity at which you're moving, and when this v is very small compared to the speed of light, this factor is factor. numerous denominator is gone, so this looks the same. And these factors are gone, so this looks the same. So at very low speeds, our naive intuition is right. But at high speeds, things are very different. And uh, the most surprising thing at the beginning is our clocks don't even agree. The time that I think that it takes before the light bulb goes off is different from the time that you think it takes before the light bulbs go off. So we don't even agree on what time the light bulb goes off. It's you know kind of crazy. So that's really what special relativity is. It's saying that we have to use much more complicated rules to relate what you see to uh, what I see. And these are what those complicated rules are. And if you follow through these complicated rules, there's a lot of odd phenomena and potential paradoxes. This is an endless source of fun problems for students. Because you can turn, wrap your head in pretzels thinking about the Turing paradox and what happens if the guy goes to off in space, goes back. You know, there's lots of crazy things you can just twist your head around. It, it makes a lot of fun problems you can give to students. But uh, um, some of these phenomena include length contraction, time dilation, and I thought what I would do today is I would just talk about one of them, which is causality. And, uh, what relativity has to say about superluminal speeds, because that will give me an excuse to um, go into what's been happening with the OPERA experiment recently and their observation of superluminal speeds. So that's 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 where I'm ultimately headed. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, causality and issues of superluminal speeds. Um, okay. So we'll come back to our example of uh, I'm standing here moving towards the light bulb. Your drive or I'm standing here, sorry, I'm standing here stationary, you're moving towards the light bulb. At some point, some time, the, uh, the light bulb goes off. And uh, we relate what I see to what you see through these sort of complicated looking equations. And one way that we deal with crazy looking equations like this is we try to put pictures to them. And there's a simple picture you can draw that gives you a visualization of, of, of what these things mean. And I'm going to be using a problem with this picture of, uh, of space. So, 
the way we think about these is sort of we're warping space and time into each other. So we go from one observer to another. And so I can draw a canonical picture of space time like this. So this is a two dimensional plot with an X. The, the, the axes are the position and time that I measure. So every point on this, we're used to, we see a plot, we're used to every point on the plot, like a point in space, but that's not what this is. Every point on this plot has the corresponding x value, which is the position where I see it, and a t value, which is the time that I see it. So every point on this plot is actually an event. It's a, an event that happens in space time. So there are several features of this plot. First, you'll see I've drawn a thing called my rule line. This is the trajectory that I follow in space time. It's, it's, it's uh, the statement that from my point of view, I start at x equals zero, and I'm not moving, so I stay at x equals zero. So as I move forward in time, as I go from time one zero to time one, time two, I don't move at all. I stay in the same place. Um, now, then I can talk about what your trajectory looks like from my point of view. You know, at time zero, you're at zero, but as I move forward in time, you move to the left. So at time one, you're a little bit to the left, and time two, you're moving to the left. And we call this sort of the space-time trajectory your whole line. And, uh, the other thing we like to draw in here are the lines the light rays follow, because the speed of light is appearing explicitly as a very important quantity. Um, so each one of these is the world line that a light ray would follow if I show light uh, as a beginning and, and, and uh, I'm going. So you'll notice as, as time goes by, a little bit later, the world, uh, light ray shot to the left is, is far along. You'll notice that the light ray shot to the left is further to the left than you are, because you move slower than light. And uh, you know, it's a little further away, it's a little further away, and so on. And if we want to talk about where the bulb is, the bulb going off is an event. It happens at some fixed distance, according to me, and at some fixed time. So it happens at this, this exact point. This is a point in space time. Now, in order to, there's, there's a lot of funny things you can do with space time diagrams. And what I'm going to want to do with space time diagrams today, the only thing you really need to keep track of are the constant time slices. So in this way, everything that happens on this coordinate axis is happening at the same time from my point of view. This is an event that happens some distance x away at time zero, some other distance away at time zero, and so on and so forth. So you can think of the progression of time, from my point of view, is going from this time slice up to this time slice up to this time slice, just moves forward. So you can think that's how I see the progression of time. Um, yeah, so, any questions? Great. <laughs> so, now, so now you can ask, uh, what do these transformations do? Well, the reason we introduced this picture is these transformations are sort of an analog of a rotation on this, on this thing. What these transformations do is they're going to tell you how you see the passage of time. And that happens, in their, their effect is to say your notion of passage of time is rotated relative to mine in the sense that uh, your t-axis is going to move towards the, light, towards the uh, uh, light ray, and your x-axis is also going to move towards the light ray. They're going to scrunch like that. So what I'm drawing here are the way you measure positions and the way you see time. And the important thing to look at is what happens to this t equals zero axis. The t equals zero axis is rotated. And this is reflecting the fact that time gets mixed with space. So the t equals zero axis is rotated. So everything that you think happens at t equals zero by your clock is on this line. So everything on one of these diagonal lines, every event on the diagonal lines you think happens at the same time. And for you, the progression in time is not from this slice to this slice to this slice, but it's from this slice to this slice to this slice. Well, that's how you see motion forward in time. So that's, that's really what you want to keep track of. And from this diagram, you can see, you think the light bulb goes off at time t equals minus 1. By the time, by the time we get to time t equals 0, the light bulb is already going off. So your clock is going to say that, you know, so here's where you pass me. By the time you pass me, this is everything that you think is happening at the same time as you pass me. Everything behind this line has already happened from your point of view. So you think the light bulb goes off first, and then you pass me. So it's uh, very odd. Your clock reads minus 1 when the bulb goes on, and mine reads 0. So the takeaway point from that, OK, well, actually, I, I, I have one more example for you. So that's kind of boring. And it's boring because there's only one event, so I'm going to add a second event. <laughs> the second event is I'm going to flip on a blue light bulb. And I'm going to flip on the blue light bulb in such a way that the yellow and the blue bulb go off at the same time on my clock. And here's a picture of that happening. So I just added the blue light bulb. And I think that the blue light bulb and the yellow light bulb go off at the same time. That's how I designed it. But to you, 
you take the yellow light bulb goes off first, and then as you move forward in time, you see the blue light, you think the blue light bulb goes off. So notice I'm not saying what you see and what order you see it, because in order to relate what time you think things happen, you have to you know, measure what you see, you know, what you, when you see the flash, and then how far, how far the flashing thing is away from you, and propagate back and figure out what time it does. We're avoiding all that complication with the space-time diagram to say that if you measure what time you think the yellow ball goes off, you think it happens at minus one, and then the blue ball goes off. To me, I think they both happen at the same time. So, the order in which events occur can look different to different observers. I think two things happen at the same time, but if you go by the fast car, and you think one happens before the other. So, that can lead to a problem, because we believe we live in a causal world. So, if an observer sees event A happening before event B, um, then B cannot have any influence on A. So if we have two events that can happen in either order, if A can happen before B and B can happen before A, then neither one can affect the other. And we have to somehow build this into our theory. So this has, you know, quite deep implications. Let's think about what those implications are. Well, we'll go back to the space time diagram and let's try to ask which events can have an impact on each other. So if the yellow ball goes off at a point that's outside of the light cone of the blue ball, where the light cone is the is region bounded by light rays, everything the light ray can reach. Um, if the yellow ball goes off outside the light cone of the blue light ball, then there are observers that can see these two events happening in either order. I see the blue light ball going off first. So it was moving a little bit fast so that their, their x-axis is only located a little bit. Still see the blue light bulb going off first, but someone going very fast sees the yellow light bulb going off first. You know, this this when they see the blue light bulb going off first, this is everything they think is happening at that time, and everything on this side happened at earlier times. So they think the yellow light bulb going off first. The word we use for this is that the yellow and blue light bulb events are space-like separated because they're not really separated in time. One can happen earlier to one person, or the other can happen earlier to the other person, but they are definitely separated in space. So. These two events are not in causal contact. Nothing that happens here can affect what happens here. Yeah. If you want, you can replace this event with me hitting the power on with my TV, and uh, this my TV coming on. If somebody was able, if there was any observer at all that could see my TV come on first and then see me hit the remote to turn it on, that would be just insanity. It would make no sense. <laughs> Although it would be pretty cool if my TV knew I wanted to turn it on before I did. So. Um, the other possibility is that the yellow light bulb goes off inside the light bulb of the blue one. Um, in that case, the yellow bulb goes off. In that case, every observer sees the blue light bulb go off first. Um, this guy sees the blue light bulb go off first. And this guy sees the blue light bulb go off first. And uh, well, there's a simple reason for that. It's because this, this, this axis here, this line that's telling us how the time slices are, can never get past the light bulb line. So that's where the speed of light is in. Can never get past the light bulb line. So we say that these two events are time-like separated because they have a definite separation in time. One always happens before the other to every observer. And in this case, the event happening here, the blue light bulb going off, can have an effect on the yellow light bulb going off. So the summary of that is that uh, is that uh, it, an event that happens here, outside of the light cone, can have no idea, cannot be impacted at all by what happens in the blue light bulb. But something that happens here can. So that means that we cannot send information faster than the speed of light. If, if, if this guy was able to send information faster than the speed of light out to this guy, then we would have a violation of causality. Notice I haven't said anything here about what's carrying the information. I've intentionally not said anyone was carrying information. I've just used these changes in coordinates that come to us from relativity. And those changes in coordinates, just through some simple arguments, tell us that if light is incapable of reaching from one event to reaching one event from another, then those events cannot be in causal contact. Just to give an example of just how extreme it would be if things could move faster than light, let's imagine that there was such a thing as superluminal neutrinos. And let's imagine that we start where our blue light goes off, and when I, when I, when I switch the blue light on, I initiate a superluminal neutrino beam that heads out here and tells this light bulb to light up either yellow or green. And I decide here if I want it to be yellow or I want it to be green. So I decide I want it to be yellow because well, I'm from, uh, I, I went to the University of Michigan as an undergrad, not Michigan State, so I prefer to go yellow instead of green. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my wife goes to state, so she'll appreciate that joke. <laughs> Um, so let's suppose
apologize that I said this up. There's an observer, a very accelerated observer. We'll see at some early time, we'll see the yellow ball go off. And then we'll watch the superluminal neutrino beam propagate back to me. And then only after all of that will see me making the decision I want to, I want it to turn on yellow. <laughs> now, I mean, okay, any reasonable person could guess that I would want it to be yellow, but that's besides the point. You know, you should not see this thing turning on yellow before I've decided that I want to make it turn on yellow. So if, if information is able to be tapped, um, able to be uh, transmitted at superluminal speeds, we would have crazy paradoxes uh, like this one. So, any questions? <coughs> yeah. The closer two uh, events are in space, the faster the the difference, uh, the, uh, gr the greater the difference between the speeds of the observers in yeah. order to make one look before the other. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Because nothing can go faster than light, no observer, the, the difference between two observers can't be faster than light. Mm -hmm. So that means that there's a minimum size within which every observer will see event A as occurring before event B. Because they, you'd have to go faster than light in order to look the. Uh, ah, so so what? Yeah, so one of the things. So we're using these space time diodes. So what you're talking about is the two an experiment like that. You would have to have two observers who will see something, but then they have to come back and sort of communicate what they saw to each other. So these are the kind of. If I answer your question, these are the kinds of um, intellectual pretzels that you can turn your head into. Um, 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 because you have to be careful about letting the observers talk to each other and try to compare their information at the end of the day. Actually, I think in Julia's lecture, she talked a little bit about relativity and the twin paradox and some of these things that had a little bit of very beautiful treatment in this. The, what the space time diagram is telling you is not necessarily what the observer sees, it's telling you after you see the light ray and you look at how far, or after you see the light and you look at how far away the vault was and you figure out what time, from your point of view, it went off, you get an answer for what your clock said. So we're Sort of by using the space-time diagram, we're avoiding we're, we're avoiding all of these complications. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Probably not, but yeah. No. Um, I have a question, not so much. It's, it's on the time dilation, yeah. more than the okay. order of events. But uh, there doesn't seem to be anything in the theory that represents a, a mechanism by which one clock is speed it up or slow it down. That's right. Uh, it's, whether it's a water clock or an atomic clock. That's right. Nothing pushing it slower. That's right. Or, and so that's a mystery in itself. How, how does it work? But but the question I had after listening to a lot of the <coughs> previous references to this is, could it do it? Could, does it have anything to do with the fact that uh, at different speeds, the, the length of time between the peaks of the waves of the light differ, that they, they come together. And, and like the, I, I actually, but, but I, but, so I, I guess to the extent that I, 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 I said, um, when I was an undergrad, I actually spent some time trying to, to, to figure this out for myself. And I tried to think about sort of similar things like this. Can I understand it in terms of, um, well, it's just, I, I can only see things that are moving. You know, I can only see the light, and, and I don't know what I mean to say this. But, um, you know, is the fact that I measure shorter distance because I've moved closer and I'm only interacting with the two lights and have to play some geometry and some angles to do this. And it doesn't work. At least I couldn't get it to work. I think it's, a, it's just a fundamental property of how it's your nature that you're going at the fast speeds, time falls down to you relative to. And I mean, I, I, it's just a, it's something that's very counterintuitive to our, 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 uh, our, our, our everyday life, but it's because space and time really are not sort of separate entities. So actually, I should probably go on because um, I want to get to the opera experiment and ten minutes so, so, uh, uh, I should be I should be done. So uh, right. So fast moving observer sees this, all this, and etc. And the takeaway point from this is that superluminal speeds can lead to information moving backward in time and a loss of causality. So naturally, um, everybody went crazy when this happened. <laughs> The author experiment last September came out with this paper, this preprint number, and I've highlighted the important part. This anomaly corresponds to a relative difference of the new neutrino velocity with respect to the speed of light of this. And you know, the neutrino velocity minus the 
and you see they report a positive number. So the funerals are moving faster than the speed of light. And the thing you really put your eye on is not necessarily this, but this. The error is quite small. Usually we look for this number to be about a fifth of that one, and it is. Um, so, you know, they saw convincing evidence they thought that neutrinos were moving faster than light, which would force us to revisit everything I just told you. Um, this is kind of a funny episode in physics. Um, this paper appeared, if I did my archive math properly, on Friday, September 23rd. And within one week, 44 preprints showed up referring to it, providing explanations of it, saying, oh, I predicted this a long time ago. My theory does this. My theory does this. Lots of papers like this. And there were a handful of papers in here that said, oh, this has to be wrong. And I should mention one of the papers in here that did say it had to be wrong, because that paper is probably you know, the most important one to come out of that So what did Alfred do? Well, CERN generates a beam of neutrinos here in Switzerland, and they send that beam of neutrinos under the ground to a mine in Italy, the Grand, Grand Sasso Mine, which is 730 kilometers away. Um, if you're, you know, I, don't, I don't know if Mark talked at all last time about dark matter experiments, but if you're familiar with this uh, dark dominant experiment that's been reporting signals of dark matter for years and years, it's in the same mine, so something funny is happening in this mine. Um, it would take about two or three milliseconds for something moving at the speed of light to make this pass. So that's the time of flight we're talking about. And the opera result is that the neutrinos arrive 57 nanoseconds early. So, and to emphasize how small a number it is, I put all the zeros in. <laughs> Hopefully, I counted the right number of zeros. It's very embarrassing if I miss one. But uh, uh, it's an amazingly precise measurement. You imagine you want to start, start your stopwatch here, stop your stopwatch here two or three milliseconds later, and do it with this position. It's, it's incredible. I mean, that's what GPS is for, but it's incredible. Um, and, well, you might ask, okay, well, before I got to this slide, there's something else I'd like to mention. Um, this is not the only thing Opera is doing. Um, Opera has a whole scientific program. Opera is measuring, Opera is trying to study tau neutrinos, they're studying neutrino oscillations. They have a whole scientific program. And I'm not part of the collaboration, but I don't think that the, the main objective of the program was to make this measurement. But it's a measurement that they did. And again, I'm not part of the collaboration, but part of the reason they did it may have been because Minos came out with this result some time ago. Minos is a more local experiment that takes a neutrino beam from the Fermi lab. Fermi lab shoots the neutrinos to an underground lineup in northeastern Minnesota, it's a dead mine. And Minos did this measurement of neutrino propagation. And they got this answer. This answer is also seeing things a little bit faster than light, but of course the uncertainty is so huge that nobody really takes this as seriously indicating anything. But sometimes if you see an interesting result like this, you think, well, maybe there's something there we should try to do a more precise measurement. And then, you know, Opera did. So, you know, it didn't just come out of the air. Now, there are some objections that came out to the awful results that neutrinos can move faster than light, and one of them is found from supernova 1987A. Um, you know, that was this big supernova that went off, you know, however many million years ago, or I don't even have my hand on the number. Um, but we saw a bunch of light, you know, we were, in, we were hit by a barrage of light rays from this neutrino, or from this uh, supernova. And a few hours later, three different neutrino observatories in different parts of the world all saw, all saw neutrino fluxes, which were from that supernova, and by you know, seeing when the neutrinos arrived, when the photons arrived, and doing a bunch of careful analysis that's way, way over my head, um, they did use this bound of the difference between the neutrino speed and the speed of light, which is times 2 times 10 to the minus 9. Opera's claimed, claimed observation was 10 to the minus 5 here, which is four orders of magnitude bigger, so this would be a violation of this bound from the right. But people said, okay, um, supernova 1987A told us neutrinos had to be moving very close to the speed of light, so often closer than Opera says, but these neutrinos were at much lower energy. These neutrinos were at 10 mega electron volts. The Opera neutrinos were at the gig electron volt range, I think which is a thousand times more energetic. So you can imagine picking up a, a theory where low energy neutrinos move slower than light, the high energy neutrinos move faster than light. Okay. The other objection came from the uh, company Glashow. Glashow is the uh, uh, Glashow is, uh, is, is, is Sheldon Glashow, who shared the 1979 Nobel Prize with uh, uh, Weinberg and Salon for inventing basically the standard model of particle physics. Glashow spent some time working with Sidney Coleman in the 90s, and Sidney, I'll probably mention in the next lecture a little bit. Um, he spent some time working with Sidney Coleman in the 90s about violations of relativity and quantum theory. So he was very well, he was very well prepared to put out this paper quickly. Um, this is a paper that came out, it was one of the 44 that came out the first week, if I remember right. Um, and their argument was as follows. They said, it's very clever. They basically use Opera to disprove itself. They said, suppose that the neutrinos coming from CERN were really moving faster than the speed of light. Well, on general grounds, those neutrinos are going to radiate energy. And we can estimate the rate at which they radiate energy. And we 
we know how much energy they're produced with the CERN. We know how, how much energy they lose in flight, so we know how much energy they should have here. And if the neutrinos were moving as fast as Opera said they were, then their energy would be so low that Opera would have zero chance of seeing them. So they basically said, aha, if you claim the neutrinos are moving this fast, you shouldn't have been able to see them. So <laughs> that's a bit of an objection. And I, I don't want really to speak for you all, but uh, um, I would say that when we were chatting about this in our group here, um, when this paper came out, um, I think this is the point where people started thinking, okay, there's just something wrong with Opera. It's just a matter of finding what it is. Um, now, the measurement that they did is a very difficult measurement. There's lots of places you could screw up. The, the precision requirement is incredible. There's a lot of issues with GPS time. I wanted to mention pulse shape degradation because early on people thought that pulse shape degradation was. Yeah. By the way, I'm going through this because I just want to emphasize just how difficult it is for these people are doing. It's very difficult. So, um, very early on, pulse shape degradation came out as a possibility for what was happening, what was causing the problems. So, um, now the string theorist is going to have to sit here and talk about data supply, so this should be interesting. Um, so, Albert didn't measure one neutrino at a time, CERN produced a pulse of neutrino. And that pulse had a profile, and CERN told them what that profile was, and that's this profile in red. So, on this axis, time, this is a sort of number of neutrinos, and so you would when, when the neutrino bunch arrives, you, you measure a bunch, and you see more neutrinos as you see more of the bunch, and then the bunch is passed, and you don't see it anymore. And you know the profile that was that the CERN produced. And what you do is you look at the neutrino arrivals that you see, and that's what these lines are, they're data for the neutrino arrivals, and you try to line them up. And you notice that if you assume the neutrino move at the speed of light, then the CERN profile tells you that your observation should be this, but your data is this. So it looks like the neutrinos got there early and you have to shift in order to get agreement with the data. So you have to shift, shift on your data in order to get agreement with what you expect from CERN. So they did a fit to tell them by how much time, how much later they had, or, or sorry, earlier they had to assume the neutrinos arrived. Now, a couple of takeaway things from this. Um, first, the amount by which they had to shift was not 50 nanoseconds, which is their signal. It's 1,000 nanoseconds. And that's because there's roughly order 1,000 nanoseconds of systematic errors and things that they estimated and they had to subtract away. So, and that leads to the second thing. This shift is 1,000 nanoseconds, but it doesn't look that big here to the naked eye. And that's because the width of this pulse is 10,000 nanoseconds. So they're assuming that they can distinguish the difference between 50 nanosecond shifts of a 10,000 nanosecond long pulse. It's very difficult to do. Um, so people suggested that if this pulse from CERN got degraded in any way, if the shape changed in any way, it would cause the algorithm to, to, to mess up this alignment in a subtle way um, that you wouldn't necessarily see with the naked eye, but they could easily remove 50 nanoseconds of here and explain your signal. So, you know, it's, it, it, there was a lot of room for error if the pulse shape changed at all. And Opera responded. They said, okay, fine, we're going to measure it. They had CERN send them uh, bunches of neutrinos, and they would send they sent them in fours. They would send four very short pulses. <laughs> The pulses were separated by 524 nanoseconds, and they were 20 nanoseconds wide. So this kind of thing is very, there's no doubt that you can, you can, um, that you can uh, precisely measure things on the order of 50 nanoseconds if you have 20 nanosecond wide pulses, and the separation between the pulses is so much larger than 50. So they redid the measurement with these pulses, and they found superluminality persisted. So I mean, these guys were very careful. They took these, these, uh, these, these criticisms very seriously. Um, but recently made a version of the news that two more uh, sources of error were reported. Um, one was a problem with an optical fiber that connects the GPS timer to the opera clock. So the GPS timer that tells them, you know, that allows them to coordinate their timing with the timing when the pulse left CERN, and there was an optical fiber that was uh, not working properly. This has been reported as a, a loose connection or uh, something wasn't plugged in properly, and that's completely wrong. This is much more subtle than that. My understanding of what happened here is you know, if you're going to connect the GPS clock, which tells you the time, to your master clock, which you're using to throw in your data, it takes, as we saw, a finite amount of time for information to travel along that cable. So you measure how long it takes for information to go along that cable, and you have to account for it in your analysis. So they had an assumption for how long it takes the signal to travel on this cable, and it turned out that if you rotated the cable relative to the ground, the performance of the cable changed, and the, the amount of time it took to go on the cable was different. I, it, it makes me. I, 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 it's painful for me to think about what things they checked before they checked this. <laughs> it's such a subtle thing to find. I mean, okay, I'm a string theorist, so I'm, I'm pretty much impressed by everything that experimentalists do. 
still with this. I heard about this. I'm like, holy cow, how do you find that? I have no idea. So this is incredible that they found this. And unfortunately, this can lead to an error in about 200 nanoseconds. And the other thing they found, which is probably more routine, they went back and checked all their components and whether their components wasn't calibrated properly, and that could be an error. So each of these errors they claimed when they came out could move the signal in the opposite direction. So if this makes the neutrino, the, the neutrino speed go down, this would make the neutrino speed go back up. So the net effect is who knows. Um, the result is we can't really trust what they said before. We just don't know. Um, they're going to give us more data later this year, and then we'll know an update on that. But in the meantime, something else happened two weeks ago. Um, the Icarus experiment, which is in the same mine as Opera, looked at the same beam of neutrinos at the same time Opera was making their measurement. Uh, they were collecting data, presumably to study neutrino oscillations and so on. And well, they made two measurements. The first thing they said was that the neutrinos weren't losing energy like they should if they were moving faster than light. But two weeks ago, they went back to the data and measured time of plug measurements, and uh, they found that the neutrino velocities were actually consistent with going out of the whole speed of light. So the only measurement we have from this mine is from the inverse experiment, and that measurement says neutrinos aren't superluminal. Okay, it's too bad. So unfortunately, Einstein wins again. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not an intelligent you know, career move to go up against Einstein. And that's probably why I emphasize that, you know, Opera has a whole scientific program. Measuring the speed of neutrinos was just a one second, I'm almost done. Measuring the speed of neutrinos was just a you know one plus tiny aspect of other <coughs> So um, that brings me to the end, I ended on time, that's good. Um, the summer takeaway points from today's lecture, Maxwell's theory uh, unifies electricity and magnetism in particular electromagnetic ways. And the speed of light can be computed by two numbers that you measure in the lab. This means that the speed of light is an absolute thing, which is weird because we're used to thinking of speed as a relative thing. It forces us to admit that light moves at the same speed for all observers. We have to change the way we relate the physics that is seen by different observers. Lots of new effects, link contraction, time dilation to talk about, but the blue is no to silent today. There's no notion of two things happening at the same time that depends on who's observing it. And information cannot move faster than the speed of light without losing causality and allowing to travel back to time. And while the light barrier was recently challenged by opera, but it seems that uh, there, was a, there was a faulty cable that who knows how they got it. Um, no evidence for supernovas in the for now. So that's it for today. And next time we'll talk about how the constancy of the speed of light combined with quantum mechanics leads us to our current picture of uh, particle physics.